large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and he said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation, he is not able to finish, and all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build, but was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with ten thousand to oppose the one who comes against him with twenty thousand? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for so therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. So, when we look at the opposite of it all, we'll want to look at what is the opposite of hate. Well, it's love. And when it comes to families, fathers, mothers, children, wives, etc., it reminded me once of coming home from work when we lived in Massachusetts. And I drove into the garage and I went through the door into the house, and the luggage was packed. And Leslie said, I'll tell you about it when we get going. Just put the stuff in the car. And so we headed to New York where our second oldest granddaughter had become seriously ill and she was in intensive care at the children's hospital <coughs> on Long Island. It seems as though what was happening to a lot of children at that time is they contracted the flu. And while they were being treated for the flu unbeknownst to the doctors, they also contracted strep throat. So now we have two things moving against these little ones. And then, while they're being treated for those two things, they developed pneumonia. And she wasn't the only one. That hospital was loaded with little children. And some of them were not living. And you could tell by the doctors and nurses when you look at them. In children's hospitals, you always try to be buoyant for the kids and so on. There were serious faces on these doctors and nurses. And so she's in intensive care with a tube in her side and they're moving all kinds of leaves of water that's building up in her lungs. But we were one of the lucky ones. She survived. But what drives people to do what they do? So I had to tell the church, I'll be there for Sunday, but I'll be gone all next week, and I don't know when I'll be back. And they all said, of course, of course. Don't worry, don't worry, Pastor, we'll take over. And in the household, this child had an older sister, three years older, and if that wasn't enough, she had a younger sister who was six weeks old. So there's all kinds of things going on, trying to get back and forth to the hospital. Uh, my daughter and Leslie going to visit while I stayed with the children, and then we'd swap off. And then in the middle of all of this, my son-in-law contracts the flu. We have to take him to a different hospital, and there's all this chaos going on, and you don't even think that you're sacrificing anything, you just do it. There's this family, 
This is love. This is what it's all about. And then you come up against a text like this, whoever does not hate father and mother, etc., etc., you say, is this what Jesus is all about? And this is why proof texting is so dangerous. If you were to give just this text as a beginning Christian, tell me about Jesus. Okay, you've never heard about him. And I open the Bible and I say, you want to know about Jesus? Let me tell you about him. Whoever does not hate his mother and father is in and you look at me and say, are you insane? This is the thing you want me to practice? But underneath this type of hyperbole, Jesus always works this kind of way beyond where you think he ought to go. But we do that all the time, right? We use hyperbole. I'm so hungry I can eat a horse. No, you can't. <laughs> he missed the mark by a mile. No, he didn't. He missed it by three inches. This tendency to expand beyond where it should go. Why is he doing this? Recall last week, if you were here, Jesus is going to a banquet. He's invited there by a Pharisee, and he's watching people jockeying for position to get as close to the host as possible. And he's watching this, and he's telling people, don't do that. Go down lower. And then if you're called higher, well, all the better. And if that wasn't enough, he goes on to say to the host, by the way, the next time you do this, don't invite the people you love, your friends, your relatives. Go out and invite the poor, the destitute. Do that, and then you will understand what I am talking about. For God will see what you are doing, and at that moment, you will be doing the thoughts of God in the world. So, if we have a tough text here, what we are saying is Jesus says, if you really are serious about discovering what the Word of God is about, or what the Kingdom of God is all about, go beyond the boundaries of your family or just your friends. You've got to get out there beyond. Why? Because if there's one thing that Jesus hates, and you can verify this through all four, three or four Gospels, he hates injustice, he hates ignorance, he hates poverty, all those things are the things that he really hates. Read it all. Don't just take this text, proof text it over against everything else that you hear in scriptures. Otherwise, you wind up with a Jesus who just asks too much. And even when he says, therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. This automatically means, you see, that next week if you're here, I expect you to clear out your bank accounts. <laughs> but this is not what it means. The most important possessions in Jesus speaking is not to be able to see through the conventions of what society teaches you sometimes. That at times you should, of course, support. We support each other in this church, we support our families and so on. But Jesus expands it out. He says, you have commonality with all human beings. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand the graciousness of what creation is all about. Because it has to overflow the boundaries that you might constrict yourself and say, of course I love my family, of course we run down to New York, of course we're there for our grandchildren, of course I'm here at church, but it's got to be more, Jesus says. And you go, oh, well, that's kind of pushing the envelope, don't you think? Yes, it is. But it's an envelope that Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you take up your cross and you put it on your back and you do things that you might not ordinarily do. And that, of course, is what happened yesterday at this church. When people gathered, first of all, we had to get a lot of money. We had to get $7,000 together. And so we did. And then once all that money was gathered, we said, okay, now, on a Saturday, we're going to come here, and we're getting all these people, and we're going to create all these food packets, and then we're going to send them out to people you'll never see in our lives. That's just one example of what Jesus is trying to say in this text. If you're just going to feed each other, then you've done it all along. Now, maybe you've heard the whole story about the difference between heaven and hell. Yeah, good. I could tell you again. In hell, everyone's eating. They've got wonderful things out in front of them. A banquet, and they're starving because they can only eat with three foot spoons. Try it all. Can't reach them all. Heaven, they've got the same amount of food, and they're eating.
feeding well because they learn to feed each other with the three foot spoons. <laughs> there is the catch. And that's the type of innovative thinking that Jesus calls us into in this text. He doesn't necessarily say, go ahead. Well, it, it, it's kind of like uh, you, you have a son, right? And he's in college, and he, you're not Christian, but he discovers Christianity, right? And he goes home, and he says, Mom, Dad, I discovered Jesus. Sorry, I have to leave you. No. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, does it? So what we have to use is common sense when we look at a text like this. Once again, if there's one thing that Jesus hates, it is injustice, poverty, the type of racism, or the type of anything else that divides us between any single person in humanity. Now, I was looking through a book, uh, well, I think it was a couple years ago, about ads that you would never, ever see today. Now, one of them was a man with his wife over his knees thanking her for giving him bad coffee. Try that today. <laughs> See how far you go. But isn't that a certain amount of sexism that they could get away in advertising? And nobody at that time and in that moment complained or to Jason Sandler and said, you're, you're, you're out of your gourd. You don't do those things. So have we come a long way? Yes, we have. But the problem is that the world is shrinking. What we could get away with a hundred years ago, we can't anymore. We're well aware through the instant communications that we have of the suffering of other people. Did you see the man uh, in the Virgin Islands who said he tried to hold on to his son, but he couldn't, and the waves pulled his son out to the sea? What does that mean to a human being? He loved his son. Jesus is calling us out to be compassionate people. It's not so much to hate all our relatives and so on, but to go beyond it. It's that type of hyperbole that simply says, don't stop here, go further. And when you go further, all of a sudden you're entering into the mind of God and how God sees creation. That somehow, the food that we send out, eaten by somebody, who our loves just as much as he loves us. So there's an equanimity going on, kind of a balance, where we go beyond what we know and what we love, and we reach out to something further. It gets out wider. It has to be that way, or we lose the whole strength of the gospel. So in 1 John, a person that says they love God and hates their brother or their neighbor is a liar. You are a liar if you say that. And there is where it all comes to point. It isn't always easy to do this. Jesus says, you know, bury, you know, carry your cross. And the only time we see anybody carrying a cross uh, other than Jesus is Simon of Cyrene. He's come to worship in Jerusalem. All of a sudden he's pulled a cross and thrown out of his back. He didn't want it probably, but he got it. And every once in a while you have one of those crosses put on your back called conscience. Conscious can be a terrible cross to carry because you look at it and say, somebody should do something about this, don't you think? And all of a sudden, that Jesus said, well, that person is you. So, if you go, sure, you're going to love your mother and father, I'm sure. That's expected. What is not expected at times is to go beyond those familial bonds of neighbors and friends and relatives and say, I belong human race of people. Fantastic variety that I see in front of me and when I see suffering, I will not say somebody should do something about it when it should be you. No, I know I'm giving you a guilt trip. Sometimes we need a guilt trip. Because it feels so easily in the midst of everything we do in the busyness of our lives to give God a blessing. I've got, I've got an hour this week. No kidding. Oh, it's not something. I give it to God. How generous. Something has to be more than that. There has to be within our minds, almost on a daily basis, to simply say, who am I now, now that I define myself as a follower of Jesus? Who do I really say that I am? 
And that is the litmus test for any one of us, all of us here, in what we do and what we say and how we treat other people, what we support, what we want to do for people when there is injustice, when there is hate, when all of these things fall apart and we say, here I am standing on a pinnacle of making optional choices, which one am I going to make? And if it isn't for justice, if it isn't for love, if it isn't for mercy, then we're in the wrong type of Christianity. It's time to rethink. Yeah, I think this is a tough gospel and it hits us right in the middle of the forehead, but it's meant to do that. It's meant to make us stop and think, where do I really sit on the issues? Where do I really place my trust and hope? Where am I really walking in this journey in life? Who am I now, now that I sing God's work our hands? This hymn is a hymn tune that we're going to sing, and it has different words to it, and it is a follow-up of God's work our hands, and it's a follow-up of what we did here in this church, the gathering of money and people. And it kind of pulls us all together and says to us, bless God our hands as we work in your name, sharing the good news of your gospel. Please stand and let us sing this thing together. 